Time Magazine published a list in 2005 of the top 25 most influential U.S. evangelicals. Ms. Roberta Amundsen and her husband Howard were described by this nationally accredited source as the financiers. Indeed, this is what they are. Ms. Amundsen is a rare breed of donor whose passion is tailored to enlightening the public on how evangelicals on fire for Christ are called to live in response to a widely secular world. Indeed, money makes the world go round, but she and her husband aspire to have their money make the word go round. Her main focus for investing in the secular world as an evangelical is based on the historical fact that the Christian church appreciated the arts and took seriously the role they could play in displaying truth and beauty in culture. As a patron of fine arts, Ms. Amundsen helps cast a vision for how the church can reclaim its civic duty of arts patronage. Ms. Amundsen is described as a warm and refreshing and beautifully humorous light that shines with intensity for the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm CCU welcome to Ms. Roberta Amundsen. Well, I am with Esther. Who was that person? Um, it's an it's an honor to be here today. I have three. I have a. I. Uh, I uh, write what I speak because I'm a better writer um, than I am extempore, because extempore, it's as Winston Churchill once was asked, um, for me anyway, can you, uh, we'd like to have you speak uh, first about something somewhere, I forget where, and Churchill said, well, uh, how long do you want? And, and he said, you know, if you want uh, 10 minutes, it'll take me about four weeks. If you want 20 minutes, it'll take me about three weeks. But if you want a whole hour, I can go right now. So um, that's, that's why I write, because I could talk for several. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. And Reagan, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Armstrong. It's good to see you again. Um, and also, it's a hard act to follow. I have to say a couple other prefatory things. I grew up coming to Colorado. I grew up in Iowa, and my father loved the West and the natural world. He loved the mountains, and he loved, he loved Alaska and Arizona. Go figure. They're not quite the same. But um, Colorado was a place we could get to in a day. I remember driving once from Perry, Iowa, which is near Des Moines, meaning you cross all of Nebraska on I-80, I drove, I must have been 17 or something. My father let me drive. What possessed him, I will never know. We left at seven in the morning and we were in Denver at two in the afternoon. Please don't ask me what the speed was. And fortunately I was not, not um, picked up and I probably shouldn't give you that example of how not to behave. So um, we, all, we, we went to the Arapahoe Park Ranch. I have no idea if it exists. It did in the 50s and 60s, and I grew up going there. Another thought, I was thinking as I was listening to you, Esther, when I was 30, um, I was living in Toronto, Canada. I had been teaching school. I had uh, been mercifully um, let go. And um, I, there's nothing like a merciful being fired. Um, God works through firing people. He's done it more than once. And it works. He fired Paul, if you think about it, from, his, from what he was doing. So um, I had taken a job. I had freelanced as a writer for several years. And I had taken a job in California that fall when I was your age. I did not want to go to California because I loved Toronto. I loved the city. And I was going to that vast wasteland known as Southern California, um, the eternal suburb. Um, so I, it wasn't my idea of what to do. But it was a job in a newspaper. It meant an income. And of course, that move was a move that changed my life. I probably wouldn't be standing here today. I certainly wouldn't be standing here today as who I am had I not done that. And I had absolutely no idea what God had in store for me. I can tell you, no clue. So um, 
I just, I tell you that, it made me muse on that, watching you today and enjoying you very much. Um, and the last thing I was going to say is this says that my talk is about pursuing um, the arts or pursuing your career or career or your life or pursuing your calling through the arts. This talk is really about the power of the arts. It is shot through with the arts. It is shot through with how the arts um, function and speak and how God speaks through them and through us as his co-creators. So it, it may seem a little different from the title. And with that, I think I'd better get on with my job here. Um, as I said, it's a great, a great pleasure to be part of this symposium about how Christians are, are to live in a postmodern and post-Christian culture. We're truly back in the third century. That's where we are. So if you want a good place to go, read the ancient Christian commentary, read the fathers. They know they lived in this same situation. Um, our, um, and the imagination of those brothers and sisters that have gone before us, their dreams of goodness were drenched in scripture. And those dreams shaped culture for more than 1,000 years. And my talk is about the relationship between such dreams and reality. Think different. With those two words, Steve Jobs created a vision, not only for his then faltering company, but also for every person who ever buys an Apple product. People who buy Apple think different, and different is cool. But the verb in those two words is where I want to start, think. How we think matters. The way you think got you here today, but the way you think and what you think matters eternally, perhaps more than you know. We become what we worship. Our vision shapes our concrete future. The Bible is very clear on this. Today we live in a world languishing for lack of genuine prophetic vision based in reality. God is reality. This affects our lives, our nations, and our world. God has given us a heavenly vision, the new Jerusalem. Christians in the past understood that they were citizens of two countries, this world and the new Jerusalem. We need to reclaim that vision for our own sakes and for the sake of the world. In 2008, when no American novelist David Foster Wallace died a suicide at the age of 46, the New York Times obituary described him as, quote, a titanically gifted writer with an equally troubled soul. In 2005, the author of Infinite Jest gave the commencement address at Kenyon College. He had this to say, this I submit is the freedom of a real education. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide what to worship. In the day-to-day -day trenches of life, adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship, end quote. And what we worship makes a difference in who we are and what we do in the world. Proverbs 28, 18 says this, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cut off restraint. We live in a time when we are casting off, cutting off restraint, and perishing, as the King James put it, because we have lost touch with that prophetic vision. Scholars talk about the demystification of reality in the West, and by that they mean that a materialist worldview has captured our imaginations. God and his vision are comforting lies. As the writer of Proverbs knew, matter is not the ultimate reality. So we seek other ways to meet a real longing. We work and work to buy more and more things. Shopping is legitimate 24-7. Any laws to restrict this are considered oppressive. Sociologist Dame James Davison Hunter at the University of Virginia describes the, the situation this way. 
We invest enormous, enormous resources and energies to encourage people to engage in materialistic consumption and spend nothing comparable on encouraging them to take their civic, public, and political, not to speak of religious responsibilities, seriously. And we, as a culture, deaden the longing inside however we can, with work, with sex, with drugs, with alcohol, with computer games. In July 2001, the British R&B singer-songwriter Amy Winehouse was found dead in her London home. She was 27. Famous for drinking and drugging, the winner of five 2006 Grammy Awards was ultimately declared to have died from alcohol poisoning, her blood alcohol level more than five times the drunk driving limit. Perhaps her novella award-winning hit, Rehab, described her inner vision. The man said, why do you think you're here? I said, I got no idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my baby so I always keep a bottle near. They tried to make me go to rehab, but I said, no, no, no. Drugs and alcohol aren't the only escapes our culture offers. There are multiplayer online role-playing games. That's one word. One part of the video gaming business that the December 9, 2011 economist said is the fastest growing form of media. The global market has grown by 60% since 2006, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, the source for the economist report. Asians, particularly South Koreans and Chinese, are among the most dedicated users. For example, a 2007 New York Times report found that 30% of South Koreans under 18 are at risk for internet addiction. In response, their government has set up 140 counseling centers in addition to treatment centers at 100 hospitals and even the internet rescue camp. On his blog, leadership journal editor at large, Brandon O'Brien, speaks to the longing of our Korean friends when he writes that the Bible calls us to adopt an imagination that helps us look beyond our own experience. The Bible writers, he says, call us to foster an imagination that can see what God sees, to imagine as the prophets did a godly future. And then he comes to Jesus, I quote, Jesus calls us to even more demanding acts of imagination he stood in the line of the prophets. The day is coming, they had said. He said, the day has come. Jesus invites his followers to imagine that the kingdom of God is at hand, and with it have come all those promised reversals. If I may be so bold, it appears that the imagination was Jesus' main target. The danger here for video gamers, the dream losers, according to the psalm writer, isn't just losing time that could be spent more productively. No, the danger is much deeper. It reaches to our very identity. Here's how Psalm 135, 15 to 18 puts it. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. We become what we worship. Would Amy Winehouse be alive today if she had had a different vision? Whatever pleasures video games provide, do they provide a vision, a dream, to build a life on? My personal no to that question comes from sad experience. Growing up in a small railroad and farming town in Iowa in the center of the United States, I attended a separatist Baptist church. No movies, no dances, not even square dancing. I was tall and smart. None of this was a recipe for an active social life. Add to that my own fears because of mental illness in our family, and you get a potent brew. Lonely? Longing? You bet. But the town's old hotel had a lovely, romantic marquee out front. I dreamed of fixing it up one day. 
Well, more than 30 years after I graduated from high school, I talked my beloved husband Howard into buying not only that hotel, but the town's 1904 Carnegie Library. We renovated the hotel, no two rooms alike, no expense spared, to reflect the stories of the people who built the town, ethnic groups, craftspeople, famous people who came from the town like the creator of Alley Oop, for those of you who can remember Alley Oop, or famous people who came to visit like Louis Armstrong. We renovated the library to make a centerpiece for a museum called Hometown Perry, Iowa, to tell the story of the unique contribution of small towns to American life. I was creating the town I wished I had grown up in. I was creating my own alternate reality, my own three-dimensional video game, my own heaven. Finally, it became clear that the financial cost was using up all of the savings my husband had accumulated outside the trust that are the source of our income. My personal vision had depleted our family resources. Howard wanted money for his own projects. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, our lawyer worried that should Howard die, I would have nothing to live on. I was also going through menopause, and my body was doing things it had never done before, and frankly, I hope never does again. I was diagnosed as bipolar II, the less dramatic but still active kind, meaning I don't go down to bus stations and take all my clothes off at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is comforting to know. Um, when I told my doctor, I knew when I was depressed, but I didn't see when I was manic. He simply said, Roberta, I've been to the hotel. <laughs> at last, our pastor sat me down. He looked at me and said, well, I, I said it seemed like I'd been committing adultery with a town. And our, my pastor looked at me and said, no, not adultery, Roberta, it's much worse. I, <laughs> idolatry. Wood and stone, indeed. From there, I could only repent, accept the forgiveness of God, close the Iowa projects, and face the constraints of a serious budget. I had to reclaim God's restraints that a lack of true vision had enabled me to cast off. We hired a business manager, a retired accountant who had worked for us for years and had started life as an IRS officer. I had to switch from my idolatrous vision to the reality channel, God's prophetic vision for my life. Only then was the town able to reclaim its own heritage and move on as it has done. So what is that heavenly vision? What difference does it make in real time? Isaiah pictures a heavenly home where there is no violence, no destruction, no darkness, no slavery, no prisons, no faint hearts, no tears, no death. Scripture makes it clear that we have dual citizenship here on earth and in our heavenly home. For example, in Hebrews 11 we are told, Abraham was looking for a city whose architect and builder is God. Hebrews 13 says, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city to come. Then John, in Revelation 21, confirms what Isaiah prophesied and what Abraham knew. He sees the city we are longing for. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Growing up in a Baptist church, I had heard those verses many times, usually in sermons about the rapture in the last days, but it wasn't until much later that I began to see they had real consequences for life right here on earth. I have to say something about the image you're seeing. It is an image, um, part of the largest tapestry series ever completed in France. It's 14th century. It was commissioned by the Duke de Berry. It is the entire book of Revelation. And if you get a chance to go to Angers, France, go, because that tapestry series is one of the most powerful works of art 
I've seen in a very long time. And this image of the new Jerusalem floating down from heaven, Christ welcoming it, God above, and there is our heavenly city, conceived as a rather wonderful French chateau, which is a nice thought. Um, in my travels, I've explored many churches and many art museums, hoping to get in touch with what Christians before me thought, understood, and did. We have a vertical and a horizontal religion. It's vertical through time. Our brothers and sisters go all the way back to the beginning of time and across the globe. It's rather exciting. Before the year 1000, churches often depicted the New Jerusalem on the arch over the altar in glittering mosaic. As you see here in the 9th century Santa Presida, that is a representation of the city four square. That's the wall that you see there. In others, the Last Judgment and Christ in Eternal Glory were above the door as you walked out, as you see here in Santa Maria Assunta in Torcello in the Venice Lagoon. This image, too, comes from Revelation 21. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory, their beauty, into it. From 793 to 805, Charlemagne built a whole church in Aachen, Germany, as a three-dimensional icon of that new Jerusalem. The church itself is designed to welcome Christ when he returns in glory to judge the living and the dead. The building is an octagon, the seven days of creation plus the eighth day of resurrection and new life. The ceiling was originally a mosaic glittering and golden, showing the 24 elders of Revelation bringing their crowns to Christ. It was copied for later 19th century restoration. The band at the base of the dome bears an inscription saying that all the numbers have meaning and that Charlemagne built the church. The, the chandelier given by Frederick Barbarossa, or Red Beard, in the 12th century represents the wall of Jerusalem here with eight gates instead of 12 in order to harmonize with the building, that it has 48 candles, 12 iron bars, and 24 golden globes, all multiples of 12. The gallery above held up by 32 stone pillars given by Popes Hadrian and Leo III. Only 21 are left, thanks to the French troops at the time of the revolution, is the setting for the throne where Christ may sit, is welcome to sit, to judge the world. Research has found that it is made of marble from Jerusalem. There is the carving of a Roman game found throughout the ancient Roman world, and there are graffiti in the shape of crosses, leading some to believe the stone may actually have come from the chapel of the true cross in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. Certainly we know that Charlemagne had a good relationship with the Muslim Sultan Harun al-Rashid, so the stone of the throne may actually be the Sultan's gift to the Western ruler. Originally, it looked straight across to the Salvation Altar, connecting salvation to judgment and eternal life. Later in the 14th century, Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV added a heaven-like chapel to honor Charlemagne and the relics of the Savior. His inspiration was the 13th century Saint chapelle in Paris, built by the French King Saint Louis to house the crown of thorns. That chapel, too, embodied the new Jerusalem. My favorite example, though, is the cathedral in Naumburg, Germany. The church became a cathedral in 1028, but a chapel to honor those founders wasn't built for another two centuries. Come with me there now. Step into the nave. The choir to the east, to the west, a stone screen with brilliant red light filtering through. Read the story in stone. The Last Supper. Judas taking the silver, his face a portrait of despair. The treacherous kiss in Gethsemane. Peter's sword severing the servant's ear from his head. Christ before Pilate, terror in the governor's eyes. The flogging, Christ struggling on the road to Calvary. Front and center, the cross, the doorpost. This may come from the fourth century commentary by the African Taconius, who describes Christ as the gateway to heaven. Above, you see Christ's bleeding arms forming the lintels of the door. Mary in agony to your left, grieving John to your right. Take a step 
another and another walk through the cross with me. Blink your eyes. Ahead is light. Just above, the founders of the church stand poised to step down to welcome you. Beyond the altar, in brilliant red, yellow, green, and blue, the prophets, apostles, saints, and virtues call out. Higher still, the Trinity and Christ in glory all welcome you into glory, into heaven, into the realm of your ultimate citizenship. But, you say, all that is well and good. But what difference did that make to the poor and hungry in their time? What difference did it make to the wars being endlessly fought around them? Primacius, an African bishop who died in 560, wrote that the pilgrim church rejoices to be formed after the heavenly Jerusalem to come. That vision was the basis for how our brothers and sisters lived in the world. These were the same, pe the people who built this vision that we just walked through were the same people who built hospitals and almshouses, even low-income housing, who inspired artists to beautify their churches and their cities. They were the same people who created the market peace to end wars for long periods of time to promote commerce. They created beauty the beauty of the heavenly vision, and that vision compelled and empowered them to care for the poor, the hurting, the living. Let me give you two examples from history. The first comes from 6th century Rome. By 568 AD, that great city was in ruins, ravaged by 150 years of Goth, Vandal, Byzantine, and Longobard invasion. Once a city of perhaps 1.5 million, Rome bottomed out at 30,000. Outside the city, continual wars turned fields back into swamps. Invaders threatened and sometimes took over once productive church-run farms. Sounds a bit like Egypt today. Malaria, cholera, and bubonic plague followed. Jobs evaporated. Once flourishing estates were abandoned. Famine became a fact of life. Floods, which you've experienced around here lately, covered the city three or four times a century. Sewers and aqueducts needed repair. The wealthy fled to the safety of Ravenna, or even far away Constantinople, Africa, or the Holy Land. But one son of an old Roman family, Gregory the Great, became pope in 590. Building on the existing infrastructure, Gregory set out to restore the, the city to life. He revamped rural papal estates to provide food for citizens, pilgrims, refugees, and urban poor, all in fair and orderly ways. Gregory also made peace with the invaders. He provided soup kitchens for the sick and infirm. He set up welfare offices or diaconi in populated areas within the walls administered by monastic congregations. Quote, the church rather than the Byzantine state was responsible for providing for the urban population. Urban his, historian Richard Krautheimer wrote in his classic Rome, A Profile of a City, 312 to 1308. Gregory's concern was not unique. Nearly 900 years later, in 1521, think about it, the year Luther stood before Charles V, the Bavarian city of Augsburg faced a housing crisis for its working poor. The Fuggers, Europe's most powerful banking family, and Catholics responded. The Fuggeri, the first low-income housing development in Europe, provides housing for the poor to this day. And looking at it, it's also beautiful. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't say, you know, you deserve to live in some place ugly. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis put it this way. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. In the 20th century, Roman Catholic philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand put it another way. Why, he asks, 
did Christ begin his ministry by making wine for a wedding party at the little Galilean town of Cana? I mean, what is the savior of the world doing making wine for a party when there are sick and hurting? Here's von Hildebrand's answer. At Cana, we find this divine extravagance, this unlimitedness of charity which reaches to the smallest detail. It is this divine tenderness, this superabundance, which excludes no gift from its intention as long as it is a beneficial good to the person. At Cana, joy was the theme. Christ was setting the theme for the reason we heal the sick and feed the hungry and help the lame to walk and, and help the poor to get out of their poverty. It is so that we all may enter into joy. In December 2011, um, the Sociological Forum published The New Normal by Amitai Itzioni. He cites a 2010 survey by EuroRSCG Worldwide, the world's largest integrated marketing agency, that reports, quote, 67% of Americans felt the recession had served to remind people of what is really important in life. 48% said that they were actively trying to figure out what made them happy, end quote. Documented longing. The idols are failing. But we know what our brothers and sisters in Nomburg well knew. We become what we worship. Aim at heaven and get earth thrown in. Walk through the cross to glory. Live in glory and make earth its reflection, a simile of the world to come. Irish singer-songwriter Van Morrison described that longing on his 1989 hit album, Avalon Sunset. I quote, I'd sing it for you, but that would really end this morning. You brought it to my attention that everything was made in God. Down through the centuries of great writings and paintings, everything lives in God. Seen through the architecture of great cathedrals, down through the history of time, is and was in the beginning and evermore shall be. When will I ever learn to live in God? When will I ever learn? He gives me everything I need and more. When will I ever learn? From this moment, you will return to your daily task. Some of you are students. Yet others of you work in various occupations. You may be contemplating marriage. Others may be thinking about a move or a new job. The rest of your life is before you. What you envision for that future will shape the reality it will become. You become what you worship. This vision thing is serious stuff. <laughs>